So before we prepare for our meditation today, uh, I have the honor of introducing our speakers that you'll hear from a little bit later today. They are our very own Angelique Wilkins and, yay. <laughs> and followed by Earl Franks. I'll tell you a little bit about each of them. So Angelique Wilkins joined the Unity of Washington DC Board of Trustees just last year. She serves as the co-chair of Unity's 100th anniversary planning committee. And apparently there's a shameless plug here, so mark your calendars for November 14th, 2020 for that event. She is also the co-chair of the office assistants Office of Assistance Love and Action Team, and she enjoys assisting with special church events whenever called upon to do so. Professionally speaking, Angelique has spent the majority of her nearly 30-year career in nonprofit association management. She currently serves as the Vice President of Meetings and Special Events for Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America. There, she is responsible for managing and planning the execution of the organization's national meetings and major special events. Prior to joining her current organization, Angelique worked for a wide variety of trade associations planning domestic and global events. And this is a quote, so I'm not judging. It says, a long, long time ago, <laughs> Angelique earned a Bachelor of Science degree from Georgetown University in government political science. And on a personal note, do you ever meet people who just make you want to be better and just has grace and excellence all the time? That would be Angelique Wilkins. She has been a wonderful addition. You are. Our second speaker today will be Earl Franks. And Earl was born and raised in Pollocksville, North Carolina, a small rural town in, eastern, in coastal Eastern Carolina. He is the youngest of three children born unto Warren and Viola Franks. He attended Jones Public County Schools. Upon completion of high school, he attended Win Winston-Salem State University, where he received a Bachelor of Arts degree in Business Administration. After college, Earl maintained a successful 37-year career in information technology. He worked for the Dow Chemical Company, Amtrak, and the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Earl recently did what I want to do, which is retire. <laughs> having, done so, having done so in September of 2018. Earl has been a member here at Unity of Washington, DC since October 2008. He says when he first heard our song that we play here called Our Thoughts, Our Prayers, he knew that he had found his spiritual home for his spiritual growth. Earl enjoys art, music, technology, traveling, and maintaining his essence of being sort of a renaissance man. One of his traveling goals is to see the world and visit all seven continents, and apparently he's close because he only has one more to go, and that would be Antarctica. <laughs> Earl currently resides in Alexandria, Virginia, and also on a personal note for Earl, he is probably one of the, he's a quintessential gentleman that exudes strength and grace at the same time. Thank you, Earl. Let's give a warm unity welcome to Earl and Angelique. Okay. I made it up here without tripping, so that's like half the battle right there. Um, good morning, unity. So um, I want to start by thanking Troy, our board chair, and, um, and I also want to thank a man uh, by the name of Daryl Everett, because I remember several years ago we were having a chat when he was trying to get me to get on one of his um, action teams, and he was like, you know, I could see you um, serving on the board, and I was like, no way, no way, and here it is, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I am so grateful to be here today, and before I get started, I do want to introduce you really quickly to the most important people in the world to me. First, my mom and dad, George and Joanne. Dad, that's you, okay. <laughs> my older sister, Maria, older, emphasis, older. 
And last but certainly not least, these are the three individuals that keep me on my toes and who occupy just about all the space in my heart, um, my precious Coase, KJ, and Kyle. <laughs> so when you all hear, when you see me smile and when you hear me laugh and when you feel my positive vibrations and energy, it's because of these individuals. And I also want to thank you, my Unity family, for so freely sharing your light and your love and your prayers for these special people whenever I have asked you to do so. So now personal reflections. Um, we all recall the first moment we walked into Unity of Washington, D.C. I was very lovingly guided here by my best friend, Betty Brentley, um, and her special spouse, Norm. Um, but I've heard many of us liken it to coming home. And I was no different. It wasn't just one thing, though, about unity that rang familiar, like the quiet power of Reverend Sylvia's voice in her words, the passion of the choir, which we heard today, or the trio's rhythmic tunes, and the food that's downstairs, and the books that we stock in the bookstore. The list goes on and on. It really was the sum total of all of these things. And it's because these parts all magnify the spirit and the energy, the vibrations of unity, and it's what makes unity what it is. And that is what seized a hold of me. I felt like my I am had finally found its home and its voice. Before I stepped across this threshold, I was really just letting life happen to me. It was really, really, really very easy for me to blame Satan or the devil for those things that were bad. Similarly, I fully knew the awesome power and the, of prayer and the importance of God in my life. But as the young folks say, and please don't be embarrassed, just keeping it 100. Um, that means being honest. That was good. <laughs> Um, God was really somebody that I prayed to, not from. It was, he was an entity separate from myself that sometimes liked me and sometimes didn't based on what was showing up in my life. And if I'm keeping it real 100, um, most of the time it felt like he didn't love me at all. So we know as truth students that Satan and the devil are, and God are not outside being separate from us. The devil is our egoic self, acting at our lowest state of consciousness. God, the good omnipotent. We affirm and we deny the devil's existence by feeding it or believing those things or starving it and denying. And we do the same with God. We affirm and believe all that is good and we deny all that is not. But most importantly, we know to count it all as good even that which seems bad, because all is as it should be. This all seems like really simple right now, but at the time it was a massive, like earthquake level seismic shift for me. When I found unity, I became fully present and fully accountable for my life, instead of just watching it unfold like I was a third party. My life became my own. I wasn't just being subjected to it, I was co-creating it with my inherent Christ spirit, that God I am, a spirit that I always possessed but never fully tapped into. God and I, my I am, started working what felt like miracles. First and foremost, I forgave people and myself. My dreams, what seemed like dreams, were manifesting. Peace and harmony took root and just started to blossom around me. And the greatest, greatest miracle was that I really saw beauty and love and light and hope where I had previously seen nothing. And that's when I began working on living a life free from sin. So we know from our teachings that sin is our separation from God, the good in consciousness. Sinning is what we do when we resort to error thinking, fear, anxiety, doubt, worry. So to live a sin-free life, we cast out all sin or error thoughts, as Reverend Sylvia calls them, stinking thinking, and from our consciousness, and we replace them with higher thoughts that are more aligned with our Christ spirit. Now, I've heard a lot of descriptions of what that shift in me looked like from my friends and family who knew me, BU and AU, that's like B before unity and after unity. <laughs> that was good, see? 
<laughs> so things like I had a happier, upbeat attitude, just kind of period in general. Um, I had an openness and honesty with people, a more positive outlook on life. Less worrisome, although if you ask my kids, they will probably completely disagree, because I still worry about them. Um, and that I just was no longer afraid. I had a persistent can-do attitude instead of cannot. A shift in my energy. My vibe was just cooler and brighter. Basically, a lightness of being. I think the most noticeable change in me was around forgiveness. It just comes really easily now, even when I feel a little challenged in this area, like we all have very human moments, I just don't stay there. Um, because I recall what I have heard here so many times about forgiving and granting mercy and what it does for the giver and the, not just the recipient. But I think it was Reverend Milton when he gave one of his talks that he summed it up so perfectly. Um, and he said, he specifically reminded us that we are forgiving and forgetting love. And his phraseology just resonated so loudly with me. I just had one of those aha moments. And my unity journey has literally been filled with a million of those like, aha, I get it moments. So that was like five years ago. It feels like it was a lot longer. I am here now and we're all on this journey together. So now what? Because we all know that once you get here and you become covered and protected and embraced and showered by all this incredible energy in this building and in this community. Once you get here and you get it here and in here, that's when the real work begins. So I asked myself, what is it, what's my job to do here? What exactly is my light? So I'm kind of reminded of the essence of my life whenever we have uh, baptisms here at Unity. I, I really, really love um, baptisms here at Unity. I, I think the special energy it always takes me back to when my babies were babies, the outpouring of love when everybody crowds up here on the podium, the laughter, because you know we know it's a little unscripted with those babies. Um, but really that moment when Reverend Sylvia reminds us that babies enter this world endowed with everything they need radiating that infinite and pure spiritual energy all wrapped up in this cute little sweet smelling bundle of joy. So I leave those Sundays feeling different, like getting a glimpse of what it was like when I was so completely in touch with my light and my Christ spirit, this little light of mine. So at first I thought I loved baptisms because they reactivated or recharged my light since I always like left here feeling really renewed. But saying that didn't really feel quite right, because to say that would almost be to admit that somehow my light is dimmed or that it goes away. And we all know that that's not true. As we grow, sometimes our humanness takes over and sometimes it may cloud our ability to shine that light, but our light and our Christ spirit never, never goes away. So again, I say all this to say, what is my responsibility as a metaphysician, as a light bearer? What's my sacred covenant? So those seemed like some really like big daunting questions, kind of like being up here today with you all. Um, but I had a little bit of a heads up because I was able to participate in Reverend Sylvia's Liberating Your Limitations course. And one of the most important things we learned there was about um, working on our internal integrity and to honestly answer what is it we have come here to be? What is it we have come here to do? To get that answer, I reflected on some of the core things that I've learned at Unity along this journey. So I just started with our four basic tenets. The first, God, divine mind, is the source and creator of all. There is no other enduring power. The nature of God is absolute good, therefore all manifestations are good. What is called evil is limited or incomplete expression of God. Evil's origin is ignorance. So just restating this in my own words, because that's how I learn, God is good all the time. And God's good is enduring, and it never goes away. 
Second, we are spiritual beings, ideas in the mind of God, created in God's image and likeness. The ideal expression for every human being is the pattern that every person is seeking to bring out. We call it the Christ. So each of us manifest our Christ in our own unique fashion. The perfect expression of Christ is therefore different for each and every person. So in my own words, as reflections of God, we are perfection personified. We show up in an infinite number of ways, as infinite as there are numbers of human beings. Third, Jesus expressed perfection and thereby became Jesus Christ or the Christ. He was a master teacher and way shower as the son of God who demonstrated the importance of thoughts, words, and deeds in shaping the life and the world of the individual. So in my own words, Jesus is my homie. Aspiring to be like him, really, he really is. Um, aspiring to be like him is a reminder that we too are sons and daughters of God, and we too can reach our fullest Christ potential. Fourth, Jesus' teachings was based on prayer, which to him was conscious communion with God. Preparation for prayer involves the use of spoken word, the creative power of word, which is made practical through denials and affirmations. Unity teaches us that repeated use of statements of truth establishes those right patterns of thinking. This is the one way that we can use the creative power of God to take dominion over our mind and our body and our affairs. So in my own very borrowed words, thoughts held in mind produce after their kind. And as Gandhi said, we must be the change that we see in the world, that we wish to see in the world, always. So what you put into the world is what you're gonna get out. It's just that simple. So reflecting on those tenets, it's certainly helped to ground me because those are some of our core teachings here at Unity. But there's a lot of scripture that also helps me to remember my responsibility as a light bearer. So I'm specifically thinking of Matthew 5, verses 14 to 16. So I feel like we probably all could recite it, but I'm gonna channel a little bit of my inner Reverend Sylvia. I love when she reads like different versions of the same scripture. It just resonates with me. So the King James Version. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. So the New Living Translation, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. So the message, which is always like the best. You're here to be the light, bringing out God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. <laughs> if I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm gonna hide you under a bucket, do you? No, I'm putting you on a light stand. And now that I've put you there on that hilltop and on a light stand, shine. Keep open house, be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. So what does all this add up to? And so kids, this is where I'm wrapping up because they're like, mom. Um, <laughs> that's true. Um, so if we are made in God's likeness and the divine gift he gave each and every one of us is the Christ spirit, then we have to allow others to see the God in us, which is our unique reflection of God. And we must see that in others all the time. That's my responsibility, the bottom line, to be that light 24-7, 365. And for me, that light, what I was brought here to do is love. And that is to be love, to give love, and to see love in others, period. So I admit that my humanness can get the best of me, but I am eternally, eternally grateful to be here at Unity, learning every day, uh, every week, how to deal with those lower traits and thoughts when they show up, how to maintain my inner integrity, like don't fool myself about the negative thoughts when they're there, just recognize them, and then do the work necessary to cast light on those, those lower traits so that I can get rid of them. 
And all of this so that I can stick to what matters the most to me, which is staying connected to my Christ spirit, that's my divine inheritance, my little light, so that I can shine on and spread love. So I wanna thank you all for embracing me and for allowing me to serve you all. Being um, a trustee is just like the light of my life, seriously. I, I enjoy every minute of it, even that which sometimes doesn't seem like it's that great. Um, like I promised, like we're getting a new roof. That was so exciting, yes, yes. I am just so grateful for my church family and my board family and my family family. Thank you for listening to me. Namaste. <laughs> That's a hard act to follow. Man. <laughs> Good morning, my Unity family. I consider it an honor and a privilege to stand before you today and to share with you what I call my spiritual journey. It was a Saturday morning in June, 1970. My mother was moving about the kitchen trying to decide what we would have for breakfast. I was sitting in the den watching TV, as I assume most kids at that age would do on a Saturday morning. I was 10. Mommy says she thinks we'll have fish for breakfast. So we started to prepare ourselves to leave the house and head for the local fish market. There was the sound of a car pulling up into our driveway. My mother says to me, who's that? No doubt, lead to determine if she should immediately change from her house coat to something more appropriate. <laughs> I looked out the window and saw a green car with white lettering on the side. The driver appeared to be in a uniform. I relayed this information to my mother. I still recall the look of concern that was on her face. The two officers emerged from the vehicle and proceeded to our screen door. There was a knock. My mother and I appeared in front of the door and I opened it. May I help you, she asked. The officer asked if a Warren G. Frank Sr. lived at this house. She replied yes and she was his wife, but he wasn't home at the moment. Is there anything that I can help you with, she said. The officer continued to inquire about the whereabouts of my father and if we could somehow contact him. My mother explained that he was at his father's, my grandfather of course, house, which was up the road a piece. Then she asked, is there something wrong with my son? Fast forward, and we have located my father and returned to our home to sit down with the officers. After careful and deliberate delivery of more information from the officers, they indicated my brother was killed in Vietnam. This is one of the few prominent events in my early life that caused me to question who or what God is. How would a God allow my brother to be taken away from us at such an early age? It was at that moment, I'm sorry, it was a moment that contributed to the beginning of my spiritual journey of trying to understand who God is. Merriam-Webster defines spiritual as of, relating to, consisting of, or affecting the spirit of or relating to sacred matters, concerned with religious values, of or relating to supernatural beings or phenomena. In the revealing word, Charles Fillmore defines spirituality as, quote, the consciousness that re relates man directly to his father, God. It is quickened and grows through prayer and other forms of religious thought and worship. 
A journey is something suggesting travel or passage from one plane to another, according to Mr. Webster. An act or instance of traveling from one place to another. Some have defined a spiritual journey as a phrase used by many different religions to mean the natural progression of a person as they grow in understanding of God, the world, and him or herself. I like this definition because it, it aligns with my own thoughts about my personal journey. I ask you to reflect and ask yourself, what event or events sparked your spiritual journey? When did you consciously make a decision to focus on who or what God is? From the time of my brother's death until the first year after graduating from college, I continued to struggle with my belief in God. I prayed and asked God to resolve all that I perceived as trouble in my life. God helped my grieving mother who had lost not only her firstborn, but her husband of 24 years, two years before my brother's death. I'm sorry, two years after my brother's death. God helped me to be like the other boys who loved to watch and play sports and gain the attention of all the young pretty girls. God helped me to resist the desire to hang out with the fellows on the block and drinking wine and smoking weed and partying until the wee hours of the morning. God helped me to be a better student in school. It was a spiritual struggle through my junior high and high school and college years. I stopped going to church and participating in any activity that fed me spiritually. Instead, I focused on being popular with the in crowd. Then I landed my first professional job after college. I owe it all to my sister who continually encouraged me to apply for an internship with her employer, the Dow Chemical Company. I applied and was fortunate to receive a spot in their program. Eventually, I landed a permanent position which I started immediately upon graduation from college. Yet something kept gnawing at me internally. There was still something missing from my life, I felt. Then someone suggested, and I believe it was my sister, that I read a book by M. Scott Peck entitled The Road Less Traveled. I purchased the book and started to read. The first sentence, followed by the first paragraph, changed my life. It reads, life is difficult, period. This is a great truth, one of the greatest truths. It is a great truth because once we truly see this truth, we transcend it. Once we truly know that life is difficult, once we truly understand and accept it, then life is no longer difficult. Because once it is accepted, the fact that life is difficult no longer matters. Upon reading these words, I recall feeling a sense of peace within my soul. These words helped me to begin to change my way of thinking about God. Rather than see God as some sort of Santa Claus who could always resolve my perceived problems, what if I accept life for what it is? In the 25th anniversary edition, which is also subtitled, A New Psychology of Love, Traditional Values, and Spiritual Growth, Peck has divided his book into four major sections, discipline, love, growth and religion, and grace. Initially released in 1978, I still find it an excellent read and would recommend it for any truth seeker today. In the grace section is a chapter titled, The Evolution of Consciousness. Peck offers his insight into consciousness and how one may evolve through awareness. He writes, 
The development of consciousness is the development of awareness in our conscious mind, of knowledge along with our unconscious mind, which already possess that knowledge. It is a, it is a process of the conscious mind coming into synchrony with the unconscious. He goes on to say that our conscious mind possesses all this knowledge which we have yet to learn consciously. Peck says he can only hypothesize an answer, and his answer is that it is God who is intimately associated with us and who is part of us. Quote, if you want to know the closest place to look for grace, it is within yourself. If you desire wisdom greater than your own, you can find it inside you. To put it plainly, our unconscious is God, God within us. We were part of, we were part of God all the time. God has been with us all along, is now, and always will be. So, there was a shift in my own consciousness. I made it a priority in my life to seek an understanding of God. I joined the church and became a member of the choir. Imagine that. <laughs> I continued to read self-help books and educate myself on the various concepts of God. I continued my spiritual journey. There were many ups and downs along the way. Sometimes I became frustrated with the humanity of being part of a church community, so I would stop going. Months would go by in the making of good money, shopping, partying, traveling, just didn't seem like it was enough. I would always, always find myself returning to find ways to feed my spiritual soul. And now, some 49 years later, since my brother's death, I am still on a spiritual journey. In many ways, I have grown and matured, have also come to realize that I will always, always be on a spiritual journey. Life is a journey, not a destination. This is a statement often credited to the great poet Ralph Waldo Emerson. Given the journey that I have experienced so far, I find this, this statement to be very true. The journey has been filled with moments of great joy and moments of great disappointment. All along the way, God has been present. It has been up to me to find her and remain connected within my being. I encourage you, as you continue your own personal journey, to never forget that God is always, always with you. As the DJ, Mr. C, says when he signs off of WHUR 96.3 every Saturday morning, if you feel you are no longer close to God, make no mistake about which one of you has gone astray. <laughs> Blessings. <laughs>